Hi, this is Ellie Fishman, and welcome to part three of three of our talk on parenchymal liver disease. And I want to make the point that at times, parenchymal liver disease and consequences of it can simulate tumors, so it can be a challenge. We talk about abscesses, we talk about sarcoidosis, we talk about angiomyelipoma of the liver, hepatic infarcts, regenerating nodules, and even AV malformations. And here's just a good example here of a patient where the patient's post-liver transplant and you're looking for tumor and the thing you find is this patient's five millimeter hepatic artery aneurysm, which can in time be problematic. Very easy to recognize, very easy to see. Now, I mentioned sarcoidosis because sarcoid is one of the great mimickers. You remember from boards, whenever you weren't sure of something or you need to mention something, mention lymphoma, mention sarcoid. They have so many different appearances. And sarcoid does involve the liver and involves multiple organs. Up to 94% of patients have liver involvement, though most patients are asymptomatic. And the most common CT finding is hepatomegaly and not going to be a mass. But you can see where uh, that indeed becomes one of the possibilities. Uh, lesions can be solitary or they can be multiple. 69% of patients had concurrent splenic lesions in one study and sarcoid is typically treated with steroids. Now in terms of sarcoid, here's just a good example, multiple hepatic lesions, multiple splenic lesions. Could this be lymphoma? Yes. Could this be metastatic melanoma? Yes. This was sarcoid. So you can see why it can really simulate malignancy. Another example here. Now what's interesting is it's not like we typically see this in a patient who has known sarcoid. Many of the times it's because the patient does not have known sarcoid and this is the first finding, and so all of a sudden you're worried about malignancy, and unless you think about sarcoid, it may take you a while to make the diagnosis. So very important. Now we've spoken about this in the past in other lectures. Now what about vascular pathologies? What else should we think about? I showed you an example of hepatic artery aneurysm, but venous as well as arterial things are something to think about. So portal vein thrombosis. Occlusion of the portal vein may be partial or occlusive, it can be acute or chronic, and when chronic, it's more commonly associated with cavernous transformation of the portal vein. It can be due to inflammatory conditions like pancreatitis, or it can be due to tumor infiltration, be it a neuroendocrine tumor or be it hepatoma. When you look at the list of portal vein thrombosis, you see cirrhosis, cholangitis, pancreatitis, hepatoma, pancreatic cancer, hypercoagulability states, abscess, trauma, so there are many, many causes. Now what do you see? If you only have arterial phase, you may see perfusion changes which can be somewhat tricky. On the portal phase, which is the best, you see the thrombus, you see the collaterals better, and you also see perfusion changes. So here's an example of a patient with cirrhosis, and as you look carefully, you will see that the patient has thrombus in the distal aspect of the portal vein extending down into the splenic vein and SMV. So one of the things to recognize, and this case is a good example, is that when you have portal vein thrombosis, it may not be isolated to the portal vein. Also, from a management perspective, you need to look if it's total occlusion or it's partial thrombosis. Very nicely shown in this example, the partial thrombosis through the multiple different renderings. And I show you a number of different images in this case just to show you how you don't see the collaterals even though the patient has extensive thrombus. Now another case, here you see thrombus but not occlusive in the portal vein, but you see multiple collaterals present, and that's the so-called cavernous transformation. Here it is on the coronal views, you see the collaterals in the porta hepatis. You indeed need to be careful at times if you don't have good enhancement. I've seen those collaterals be called tumor. Very nice example of the thrombus in the main portal vein, but it's not occlusive, but we see the cavernous transformation very nicely seen in this example. Now, let me just mention portal vein aneurysms. They're uncommon. Uh, it's usually the main portal vein, and they're typically over 20 millimeters in size. The thing is, you can see it very nicely here, but you can imagine without IV contrast, or in the wrong phase, or if you're not thinking, you really could worry that this could be a tumor or a vascular arterial aneurysm or a mass coming off the duodenum. This is a portal vein aneurysm. And here's a second example. So it's something to consider. It's not uncommon. We once wrote an article about this, portal vein aneurysms, focal dilatation of the portal venous system.
Uh, it's a fusiform shape, maybe most common. And although portal vein aneurysms are the most common visceral venous aneurysms, they're quite rare. In this article, we also made the point that most patients with portal vein aneurysms remain in asymptomatic, but occasionally patients present with abdominal pain or back pain and a range of different symptoms. It's pretty rare for them to rupture, but it is something to think about. Now, when you talk about aneurysms, we typically don't think about venous aneurysms, we think about arterial aneurysms. So, um, splenic artery aneurysms, the most common is splenic artery, and hepatic artery is number two. Aneurysm rupture, high morbidity, and high mortality. We are seeing increased incidence of aneurysms for a number of causes. In part, they've always been there. Now with CTA, we see them even when they're very small. And it's important to recognize them, particularly if they begin to get larger or if they're over a certain size, typically over 1 to 2 cm because of the high morbidity and mortality. As I mentioned, splenic artery is number one and hepatic artery is number two. Occasionally, like in this example, you can see multiple hepatic artery aneurysms. Now you can see multiple aneurysms in patients with like Lowy's Dietz syndrome. You can see multiple aneurysms or pseudoaneurysm patients with polyarthritis nodosa. So I do make the point if you see one aneurysm to keep looking because as in this case, you may see multiple aneurysms. And again, here it is with the volume rendering. Very, very important. Now, one entity that gives you multiple, almost too numerous to count, small aneurysms or telangiectasias, whatever you want to call them, or shunting, uh, or AVMs, is HHT disease, where on arterial phase imaging, you see this incredible appearance of the multiple areas of AV shunting and telangiectasias, and they quickly become isodense on venous phase imaging. This is also known as hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, or Rondu Osla Weber disease. These telangiectasias or AVMs can involve the skin, the lung, the GI tract, and brain. And again, uh, it, we typically are looking at the chest looking for PAVMs to embolize, but when you're doing that arterial phase imaging, it's not uncommon to see the liver involvement. We also see involvement by the pancreas, but with the liver involvement, it's very important to recognize that those lesions become isodense on venous phase imaging. So again, very, very important to recognize. And there have been several good articles. This article just published um, that HHT autosomal dominant, one to two individuals per 10,000. Again, the fact is that they evaluate and involve the GI tract amongst the most common sites. And when you look at the Coracio criteria for HHT disease, you can see that visceral AV malformations are one of the criteria. In looking at this article in more detail in the liver, telangiectasias were the most common hepatic vascular abnormality, seen in up to half the cases, large confluent vascular masses, perfusion changes, and shunts were all seen, but in lesser frequency. So again, very, very important. Uh, in patients with the diagnosis of HHT, it's something important to consider. Now, let me just go through a little bit more from that article. Frequency of involvement, eight to 30 percent of the liver. Half the patients are symptomatic. When symptomatic, patients can have high output, cardiac failure, portal hypertension, and biliary cystic disease. So those are indeed all going to be very common. And it's interesting, when you look back, there have been articles over many years talking about Multiplanar reconstruction volume rendering are well suited for picking up the vascular and biliary abnormalities in HHT disease. And here's just a good example. Prior AV malformations in the lung, but there are still AV malformations, right middle lobe and left lower lung, for example. And here is the vascular changes within the patient's liver, dilated hepatic arteries and branching and AV shunting. Here's another example with multiple AV malformations within the liver really nicely shown, almost looking like a beading type appearance. And here it is again with MIP imaging from above and from straight on. Again, looks like a lot of miliary lesions, so you can see where it can be tricky, but here it is 30 seconds later and everything looks perfect.
and here those images are side by side. Now I also should mention we see shunts in the liver, AV shunts. At times they can confuse you with vascular metastasis or a vascular tumor. If you have any doubt, just looking carefully, you can see here the uh, portal vein to hepatic vein AV shunting, and you can see the draining into the IVC. We also talk about pitfalls, like this case of a vascular lesion in the liver, but it's right by the falciform ligament, the so-called hot spot, and you can see the collaterals coming through the internal mammary, and if you're epigastric, and that's a very common zone of increased attenuation in patients with SVC occlusion, and that's a so-called hot spot, initially described in nuclear medicine studies and really nicely shown in this example. And here it is with the volume rendering, and here it is with the MIP imaging. And here's another case, again, that classic hot spot by the falciform. There's the vessels coming off the intercostals and internal mammary. Really a pretty, pretty appearance. And the big thing is, once you've seen it, you recognize it, you're not going to confuse it. One thing helpful as well is because the patient has collaterals and SVC occlusion, you can see multiple collaterals in the uh, chest wall and upper abdominal wall. Of course, the times you can get confused, or at least potentially confused, is when you're only scanning the liver, and so you're not really aware of what's going on in the chest. Here's just a nice example of an AV malformation. Now, in talking about the liver, I thought that maybe I should at least make one other comment about something I didn't speak about, that one thing we can look at are different deposition diseases in the liver. The most common is iron hemochromatosis primary autosomal recessive versus secondary, which is due to transfusions. Hemochromatosis can also involve in primary the pancreas, and with transfusion it typically involves the spleen as well. With iron deposition, the liver is denser than the spleen and denser than muscle. It can have a similar appearance to some drugs like amiodarone, but then you see interstitial lung disease, as well as glycogen storage disease. And on MR, low signal on T2 and T1 imaging, liver and spleen lower in T1 compared to muscle, and signal dropout on in-phase uh, gradient echo images. And here's just an example of amiodarone toxicity with a dense liver and hemochromatosis very, very similar type appearances. Now, there is some work done with dual energy in looking at uh, things like hemochromatosis. There's also dual energy being done for different parenchymal liver disease, but again, uh, it's still preliminary work. In this article by Joe, dual source, dual energy can be used to diagnose important hepatic iron accumulation with sensitivity of 80% and specificity of 90%. So again, it's something that potentially can be of value, but at this point, it's sort of a work in progress. So I've now gone through three talks and shown a number of different things as it relates to parenchymal liver disease. We discussed fatty infiltration of the liver, we discussed cirrhosis, we discussed some of the challenges with Bud Chiari and things like regenerating nodules. We looked at some of the spectrum of abscesses and infarcts. We looked at various vascular pathologies from aneurysms to pseudoaneurysms. We looked at venous aneurysms. We looked at non-neoplastic disease. So we've covered a lot of things in the three lectures, but it's important to remember that parenchymal liver disease is very common. It's far more common than metastasis or primary tumors, and we typically spend a lot of effort thinking about primary tumors or metastasis. So we need to spend a lot of time thinking about parenchymal liver disease, and as we mentioned, things like uh, steatitosis, uh, the, the whole area of um, NASH are only going to be increasing in importance uh, in the coming years. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and hope you enjoyed the series. Catch you later. Bye. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.